Okay, hi, welcome to Real Exposures. Real Exposures is an interview series produced by the B&H Event Space. And uh, we're very happy today. Uh, this is our second installment of Real Exposures, and we have the hard to pin down Sean Kernan. Sean is truly a photographer of another color, uh, primarily a commercial and fine art photographer. He's also responsible for teaching many classes at Maine Media Workshops, Santa Fe Workshops, and at other colleges and institutions across the country. He's a sought-after speaker, and uh, Sean, welcome to Real Exposures. Thank you very much. So, I think that maybe our audience might actually be a little bit unfamiliar with you. So I want to go a little bit into your background. Can you uh, tell us about your uh, your photography and your past? Uh, yeah, well, I can I can say that I, I backed into photography. I never wanted to do that. I never wanted to be a photographer. But I was working in theater, and in order to work in theater, you need uh, six other people and a few hundred thousand dollars, and a photographer just needs a camera. So I would wander off on my own and do it. I uh, stumbled into my first story in Look Magazine, this wonderful magazine that used to exist, after three months after getting my camera. And I said, this is easy. So I'll just do this. And, and on that delusion that it would be easy, I've, uh, I've stayed there ever since. And it's just been the perfect, the perfect meet. You say a delusion to be easy. Photography hasn't been an easy path for you to follow? Oh, it's never been easy since then. And, and indeed, it shouldn't be. I mean, it's it's being not difficult, but challenging wakes you up to what you have to do. Otherwise, it becomes like, you know, going in and doing root canals every day. So, um, so I've appreciated the difficulties of it. I was exposed to you at the main media workshops, and I, I took your class two years ago, and it really did have a, a quite an impact on me. So I want to thank you for that. That was uh, that was great, and I've been able to take that impact and, and bring it to to B and H and our, our customers here in the event space. That's great. So that was wonderful. Uh, some of your early work, you have two published books under your, uh, your belt, and it's uh, Among Trees and uh, Secret Books. Uh, care to tell us a little bit about, uh, about those projects and publishing a book? And Oh, publishing a book. Let's, let's set that one aside for a second, because the fun of it and the beginning of it was really the secret books. And like every project that's worked out well, it kind of surprised me. Um, it was not something I planned to do. It was much bigger and more ambitious than anything I planned to do. but. You know, it's like you write a page, and then you put it aside, and you write another page. And you do that every day for 365 days, and you have a novel at the end of it. Not a, necessarily a good one, but it, it, it pulled me in like that. Mm -hmm. And it put me also in relationship to, the, to Jorge Luis Borges, whose stories we used, uh, who is this extraordinary figure of, of world literature, really. And, uh, and there I was doing a book with him. Mm -hmm. Not that he knew it at the time, because he had, he had passed on, but it was an extraordinary wow. chance to go into that. Borges is, is a universe, hmm. and all of, the, all of the really interesting projects I've done have taken me into physical universes or, or mental universes. Approaching the project, how did you take his words and your photographs? Were you looking at his words and then making photographs? Or? A good question. Anybody, anybody who tried to illustrate Borges would be a fool. And, and I, I wasn't even thinking about that. And I was showing it to, uh, to a friend of mine, Lana Rigsby, down in Texas. And she said, Borges. And it was like a key in the lock. Of course, of course. So that's, uh, that's, that's and, and I never tried to track them together. It was really, oh, it was really a journey of these, these stories and these photographs walking side by side, but not, not referring to each other and not arising from each other in any real way. But but a perfect, a perfect coming together. You know, when I looked at those images, uh, a couple of things came to mind. And one question I think many of our viewers are going to have, was there any Photoshop involved? No, no. Oh, thank you for asking that. It was all pre-Photoshop. And it was, anything that you see in the images was actually happening in front of the lens. And it's, sometimes it's a little clunky. And that's, I'm, I'm not trying to make the illusion. I'm trying to make the connection in the mind. So. Um, it was just sort of, Photoshop was just coming in, but no, it was all done on that wonderful Polaroid Type 55 in front of the camera. Nothing in the dark room, there wasn't any like a, uh, a Jerry Ullsman type treatment? I did or? one double exposure. Okay. okay, truth to tell. <laughs> all right, secrets <laughs> out. Um, and now after that, you, your second book, Among Trees, uh, was after secret books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just, it just kind of grew out of whenever I was someplace, I'd try and stay an extra day and wander around a little bit or a week if I could. And, and, uh, 
photograph trees, go look. And it was really kind of an exploration more of, mus of musicality of composition. I mean, I could have done the same thing with toothpicks, I think, or match heads, but it was looking at music as interval and sound and the space between them, loudness, softness, and I, and I thought, what is, the, what is the photographic equivalent of that? So that's kind of how that project started. And then this astounding thing happened, which is a publisher called me up and said, do you have a book? And I said, well, I, I might. I might have the beginnings of one. So I went and showed it to them. and. Uh, they wanted to come right out with it, and I said, no, you have to give me another year. Hmm. So I really was able to think of it as, as one piece rather than... How much time have you spent on, on your books from pretty much start to published and final uh, first edition? Uh, years, usually hmm. years, and, and it's not that one works on them all the time, but I spend more time on my, on my work, the work that is arising from some thing that's going on in me, than I would ever than any client would ever let me spend. Hmm. Uh, and I, I, I hope they're subtle and complex, and that's how they get that way, is by manifesting it and then rewriting it, so to speak, and then hmm. rewriting it again. Now, you run a, a successful commercial studio in Connecticut. Vastly successful. Okay, yeah. vastly <laughs> successful. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, I checked your profile here at B&H, and you've been making purchases steadily <laughs> for, for a long time, so that's we know it's successful. Uh, how much... If you had, uh, if you had a glass of water, how much of that filled glass of water is your personal work and what you want to pursue, and how much is that glass of water your professional commercial work that you have to, to work on? The important water is all what I pursue, and what lets me do that is the commercial work. And I love commercial work. I love doing jobs. I love solving problems, mm. but at root, it's doing something and saying, if, if this will let me go back to Africa, or this will let me go to India, or this will let me uh, buy the time to, to, to do nothing, some empty time. I would say the important time, and probably the greatest amount of time is spent on personal work. Okay. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have been able to, to balance the two. You know, you're talking about Africa, and you have a, a body of work that the Kampala uh, Boxing Club. Yes. And where is that in, in Africa? It's in, it's in Uganda. It's this little, dark little place under Nakivubo Stadium. And mm -hmm. I, I wandered in at the suggestion of a friend. And again, I talked about universe. The universe of, of a young, poorish African boxer is so alien to my life and so alien to me. And, and I walked in, and I was welcomed so... If a door opens, you're a fool not to not to walk through it. And I've been back twice now, and hope to go back again this winter. You had uh, told me some stories about that, and it was uh, there was one fighter in particular who he didn't quite make you feel welcome. Yes, <laughs> a yes. little threatened. I think he was a guy who'd been hit in the head a few too many times. He was he was an older guy. Be and careful, he's watching this. So <laughs> you want to if he watches a copy not. of this, he's just like, don't put this on Facebook. Okay. Um, he, he was an older guy. They were incredibly warm and friendly people, although you walk in and there's a group of severe-looking guys and they're tough and they could take me apart in a second. Uh, but they were very, very friendly. And this one guy, I was photographing him, and his, his face, he was so covered with beads of sweat that it looked like stars in his face. Mm. And, and that's what was fascinating me. And I was working away. In the end, I got to be a little, a little leery of him. I think he wanted a lot of attention and maybe more than I was ultimately willing to give him. So I kind of, he wasn't my buddy. <laughs> okay. How do you uh, work in an environment where there would be, I mean, you could smell sweat and you could feel fear. I mean, it's an, it's an environment that is that's, that's quite violent. And uh, let's face it, you were, you were among trees, you were working on, on secret books, and now you're and in then, a, a, a boxing club yeah. underneath a stadium in Uganda. Well, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's um, w when I got back, and I did a first edit of this, and I showed it to a friend of mine, this wonderful documentary producer called DeWitt Sage. And DeWitt, he's really the only person I show my work to because he just sits down so seriously and digs into it. And he always comes up with an important thing. And he said, he said, Sean, were you ever afraid when you were doing this? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, there were times that I was. He said, don't you think that should be in the pictures? Oh, yes. Of course, you know. 
So, so that becomes part of, part of one of the things that has to happen. Did you edit in fear in, in the... There's a plug-in. You, you can you get plug a plug-in. It's you know, a Nick. It's a, <laughs> no, I, 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 that's part of the reason I want to go back. I, I, I want to... I, want, I actually want to go where they live a little bit more. Uh, I want to see more fights, and I want to, I want to find that nervousness. Now, whether, it's, whether it expresses itself compositionally, part of the thing about those pictures is you can't compose them. It's just happening too fast. So you, you're really riding on intuition, and, and I think that will turn Did up. Did you find yourself physically further back from these subjects than you would have with a uh, conventional subject? Well, they were, they were sparring, and, and I was back far enough that I didn't want to get hit, but I kept getting pulled in. And, and the funny thing is when, you, when, you, when you're looking through a camera, that <laughs> other reality recedes, mm. and it just becomes this little thing in front of you. you could, I, I've, I've been in situations where there's tear gas and rubber bullets flying around, and I was in the middle of it saying, doesn't mean me, got nothing to do with me. I'm just a photographer, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. You know? I forgot about that, that's your work in Ireland. Yeah, right? Northern, Northern Ireland, Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Have you been back to Northern Ireland since? I have not, I have not. Because it's a much different landscape it now than it was. Thank God it is, yeah. thank God it is. That's good. Um, did you feel that the images that you made in that conflict uh, in Northern Ireland and you brought those images back, where were they being published? Where were they? Being um, that, that wasn't really the first question. I think maybe Saturday Review published a few of them. But a, a lot of the work that I do, the important work is shoot first and ask questions later. Go because here's one of these incredible events of our time, Northern Ireland or Africa or prison or mm -hmm. any of these places. And just to have experienced them, you see differently when you come home. You're, you're a larger person. You're, all, all of your aperture is enlarged and, and, and you're seeing through something much larger. So I, mean, uh, I had a friend, I was, I was buying a piece of equipment once and he said, do you have the business to, uh, to justify that? And I said, if I started that way, I never would have become a photographer. <laughs> okay. And the same thing with the plane tickets. You, you just go. You just go. Um, now, I, I bet you up at, at the main media workshops where you, you teach a, a, a very special class, uh, the uh, creative photographer, no, photography and creativity. Yes, something right? like that. Something like that. We change it every, every time. <laughs> uh, and uh, this, this class is very unorthodox to normal classes because you encourage uh, to do everything but make photographs uh, and explore other uh, aspects of behavior and look into yourself and mm -hmm. if you care to elaborate on, on what that class is, has evolved. Yeah, it, it evolved when I was asked to teach, a, to teach a class in college. Somebody else wanted to leave in the middle of a semester and I, protected by my ignorance, said I would do it and then realized I had to come up with something. And since I'd never studied photography, I didn't know how to teach photography, but I thought, what's exciting? What is interesting? What's interesting is, is the, the encounters that you have. What's really interesting, where it really happens, is everything that happens up to the moment you pick up the camera. Mm -hmm. And everything happens that happens during that and after that is also interesting. But if you don't have the first part and go through it consciously, then picking up the camera is not going to do it. That's part of why you see bad pictures around, I guess. So, um, so I, I drew on my background in theater and, and had them set the camera down and be in relationship to whatever it was they were photographing. And it could have been a person, but it also could have been an empty room. Um, it could have been sound. It can be, it can be, it deprives people of diving for the camera or for the mm -hmm. photograph first and makes them wait and say, what else is here? What else is mm -hmm. here? And then it just gets... Richard. You know, I think when you would open up every class, uh, every day that we, we took this class, you'd open it up with a, with a gong and a, and a meditation. Yeah. And I think that was a wonderful way to, to start the class because it, you just, the meditation was, that was long. You had us sitting there for about three and a half hours doing nothing. <laughs> now. But it, it would definitely clear you out and get ready for your, yeah, your, yeah. Uh, your agenda and for it's, that day. It's when, when one starts, when I started, there's a certain spaciousness in your life. Nobody expects you to turn up and do anything at all. So. But now we've become very busy as a culture and you age into it a little bit and you think, well, here's, where's my list? And you make your to-do list and you start down it. But, but somebody once said, you, in order to make good art, you have to allow yourself to be bored because that means you have to go outside your plan. And, and the plan is a boil down of what you need to do, but you have to look at it before you boil it down. So that's the purpose of that. 
So uh, when you were uh, moving on your, your first uh, foray into photography, you, you had a run-in with a, a pretty famous photographic instructor and influence on, on modern photography. Yes. Uh, yes. Care to tell the, the story about, uh, about your voice? <laughs> my, my, entire, <laughs> my entire photographic education, I'm, I'm self-taught, although I worked very hard at it, uh, but I'm self-taught, and after I'd been teaching at the New School for about four or five years, I called up Lisette Modell, who was teaching there, the great photographer and teacher, and I said I was a colleague of hers, which is pretty presumptuous. I said, could I come study with you? And she said, bring some of your work down and we'll talk about it. Bring your best work and some of your worst work and we'll talk about it. Seemed like an odd request. But I went down and, and I brought my best work and, and handed it to her. And she, Lisette was about this tall. She was brilliant. She was cranky. If you could take what she had to say, she was very direct. If you could take it, you'd really learn a lot. But it's sometimes hard to take. So she's going through the work. And, she's, and I won't try to do the Austrian accent, but she was going through. She said, oh, look at this. She said, this is wonderful. She says, it's like Strand, better than Strand. I hate Strand, she said. And she <laughs> went on from there, and, and I thought, I, I knew I was going to get a lesson. And at the end of it, she looked at, she looked, she said, darling, these are perfect. Why have you come to me? I said, they're not perfect. I think, I think they're lacking something. I think they're okay, but they lack something. She said, life, they lack life. And, and she was absolutely right. As she was pinning my ears back, it was a the time when you photograph when you want to get it under control and then what I had to do was let it run um, and sh she looked at what I called my worst work and there were things out of focus there were there were things that were uncontrolled and of course that's that was the energy that was trying to break out of my control at the end of it I said so will you will you take me as your as your student she said no darling I have nothing to teach you but you have so much to learn, she said. <laughs> so I staggered into the street, and that was my afternoon's photographic education. Well, she was your Yoda, would you, would you she say? Was so? Yoda. <laughs> she, she was my Yoda. She uh, was my Yoda. You had an interesting experience teaching up at the main workshops. A couple of years ago, you didn't teach the standard uh, photographers that go up to the workshops to be taught. You taught a master class with some very famous notables in photography, and creative powerhouses took your class. Um, Care to sh shed some insight of what it was like to, to teach Jay Mizell and John Paul Caponegro it was, and it Elizabeth Opelman? It was absolutely wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. There was uh, somewhat to my surprise, and only after I said I'd do it that I started to worry that maybe I'd made a mistake. Uh, but I was delighted to find that not every teacher can be a student, but everybody who signed up for this could let go of that. There was nobody who had to be the best photographer mm. in the class or the most experienced. All that stuff was basically already settled. And we decided almost right away that we wanted to work with these exercises, but not necessarily take pictures. Could if we wanted to. And, and what delighted me was the, the fact that, that all of these really wonderful photographers submerged themselves in the process and, and did it with as much attack and as much commitment as, as you could ever ask for. And that's, that's where I think a class is wonderful, not that, you, not that you do stuff well in it, but that you do it with abandon. What was the most memorable thing to come out of that class? If you can sum it down to one memory that stands out among the... the there, there were so many, but one of the things I did was have a, a choreographer friend named Allison Chase come in. And photographers don't move any more than most of us, but um, she, had, she had us doing these simple exercises, just little imitation exercises, and she built it out and built it out, and she divided the class into, into three groups, and each group had a little routine that they worked at. And then she put on music, and all three had to do it, and there had been no connection between these three groups and what they were doing, so we had to find it as a group, and it was like about a 10-minute thing of all these people traipsing around the room and dancing, and they had to, different groups had to respond to each other. They had, they had to act with each other, work with each other. And it was just amazing. It was, like, it was like watching children, which I do a lot, uh, but it was like watching children who just want to go as far as they can with the mm. thing without regard to whether it's right. To bring you up to present times, you, you, you've been working on a project in Montana uh, with the, uh, uh, the Crow uh, tribe in, in Montana, yeah, a Native yeah. American tribe, uh, and you've made uh, 
you've made a little bit of a switch, which is kind of very current right now. You, you're not working with still photography. You were working with a 5D Mark II, and you're taking footage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another one of these things that I backed into, somebody asked me, do I want I mean, I would never turn up on a reservation and say, can I hang around and take pictures of you guys? I just couldn't do it. Uh, but somebody invited me, and I went. And the first time I went, I hardly took a picture and no good ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I got home, I thought, maybe this has to work in time. Maybe that's the thing that has to happen. Um, so I went back this last spring and again last week and spent about 10 days uh, just with, with no plan, which sort of, sort of was difficult at times, but just to be there and whatever happened, including nothing, which happened a great deal of the time, to, to let something start to evolve. And it's, sometimes it's language, sometimes it's the train going by, it's wind, which is a great character in the, uh, in, the, in the landscape there. And it's probably a number of trips yet to come, but just to, to, to let this thing tell me what it wants to be. And it'll tell me by I do it, I do it, I do it, and then I see it. Now, the, the tribe had given you an honorary uh, name. Yes. And uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but he who comes it's, to help. Yes, Hilego Magoshibish. Magoshibish. And it means uh, somebody who comes from far away to help. That's a lot to live up to. You, you have to help now. I mean, you're, you're not, you, you said before that uh, you like the fact when you can work on a, on a personal project and you, you want to explore that and please yourself. And yeah, working with a client, they put, they make you, uh, they put you in a box a little yes, bit. Yes, yes. You've been put into a box, now you have to help. How are you, do you find that to be daunting or challenging? It's very daunting. And, and if, so, if somebody said to me, what's the solution to the problems of the Crow tribe or the American Indian or, or the Australian Aborigine, I would I'd just put my head down and say nothing. Um, but I think one can bear witness and one can go in, I can go in and see what I can see and try and capture that and bring that out. And it will be imperfect. And as with all these things, somebody will look at it and say, well, that's not at all, that's not, you know. But it'll reach whoever it reaches. In the meantime, it transforms me. Now, the other challenge with this is that you're, you're on location. You, you, this is a fairly important project. And you'll see here in the studio, we, we've got a lot of staff. We've got grips, we've got lighting, cameramen, we've got directors, we, we've got other helpers. You're there with a with a, a filmmaking device, and it's just Sean. Yeah, could I actually, could I borrow them? You borrow the crew? <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's, I, I know it would be helpful to have somebody else running sound. I know it would be helpful to have a grip. I know it would be helpful to have lights. But if you walked in with all that stuff, whatever, I mean, this is, uh, the, the, the 5D and the mic is sort of the equivalent of Cartier-Bresson's Leica. And that's as much stuff as I think I can bring into that mm. setting um, without, without changing the event. I mean, e even that changes the event. Mm. I, uh, I have this wonderful piece of footage and I'm filming this family and they're speaking in Crow and this man sitting at the table and he goes, <sighs> like that. And I know he's responding to me. Well, I hope that that will fade away, but to reintroduce a crew of any kind, what I think I think would damage that. Did you work with uh, with any of the rigs, or were you holding hand holding the camera? Did you work I was. With Red Rock I've been. Or? I've been. I've been. I learned about tripods okay. <laughs> after the first trip, after watching my footage do this, and <laughs> and just getting sound down. You know, I'm so, sort of figuring it out as I go. Um, I think I think a Red Rock would be very nice to have, and and that kind of stuff, and also whatever the the sound is more the issue than anything at this point. And I think we solved that by doing a lot of double system. And I hope that the the new Canon, I hope that somebody's off at Canon figuring out how to make a tiny little thing that you can <laughs> slide into that body that will do sound. Mm -hmm. That's the Mark III. We'll, we'll, we hope we'll put you on the yes. design team okay. for that. Uh, um, I'll consult. I want to talk about your, again, going back to your teaching methods where you're incorporating uh, a lot of improv into the teaching and uh, really doing almost anything but photography. Is there anything when, when somebody is approaching their, their photographic career and they're looking at projects in front of them, uh, is there a way to find your path a little say easier? But can you give any advice on, on finding your, your path in photography? Um, well, 
What worked for me was to, to allow it to happen in the way that it did. Um, somebody coming to the medium now, I would say, um, when I started, you were a photographer. You would give your work to the designer or the art director, and they would do their work, and then they would hand it off to either the production people or whatever. Now, I think one has to do everything. Hmm. One has to be conversant with everything, whether you do it or not. Because I think, I think all of these roles have been pushed together and then pieces of them are pulled out and, and reconfigured. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think just being, I think you should be awake and you should be thoughtful and you should sort of understand maybe writing so that you know how things have to structure, whether it's visually or, or an idea. Um, and I think it's probably always been true of all the, all the good photographers that they had these other skills nascent, but now, now, they, now you really use them. Uh, I really have two questions for you now, and that's, uh, first one is, is uh, you had a model that you were very successful at your commercial studio, and I've heard something very frequently spoken by uh, professional photographers that um, are a little bit beyond mid-career, mm -hmm. and that's how do you adapt to the new models that are happening now? Are you, I mean, you're embracing video, which is yeah. definitely kind of You complain bitterly about everything. Mm -hmm. No, um, you know, it's, it's, Media world is changing. World is changing. So, the magazines that used us, the the uh, the music world that used us, all these things, television are are just in flux, and nobody really quite knows what that is. And it's and so in a way, you have the choice that say a really good blacksmith would have had in 1907. He would have said, "Damn it, I just wanna I just wanna shoe horses." And his son may have said, "What are these cars? Could we fix them? Do they break? Maybe we should learn how to do that." So, so I think I think one at any point in one's career has to have that that kind of flexibility. But uh, uh, the other thing that's true is, uh, and a friend of mine said this in the last class I taught, a professional photographer, a very gifted guy, and he said, you know, the people who survive this are going to be the ones who love taking pictures. And if you don't take that for a walk all the time, and instead sit around and worry things, or or you know try and figure out where it's going, take pictures and, and let them tell you where to go. Do something so wonderful, so affecting that anybody who looks at it will say, my God, hmm. it's like Robert Frank. And, and, and don't expect to be congratulated on it when you first do it. But you're going to get stuck with it. You're going to get stuck with that vision and then it saves you. Aside from uh, the Crow Project and uh, you just recently did for, for Mass Mocha, a, uh, a performance piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you care to elaborate uh, sure, on that? Sure. Sure. It scared me to death. It terrified me. It was a part of part of what happens as a photographer is I'm the guy who turns up and it's all about what I'm going to do. So we had seven dancers. We had a choreographer, a videographer, a sound guy, a music guy, and a projection guy, and a stage crew and a and a black box theater for a week, and uh, and it was beyond any of our control. We could only do it by 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 listening, it was it was like three dimensional pool or something like that. Very elaborate, very complicated, um, and you sort of had to trust that something would happen, and so you didn't trust that something would happen mm -hmm. on Monday. And uh, it was as I, it was as though we'd all gone shopping at different grocery stores and bought a few things, and we had to make a dinner by Friday, mm -hmm. and we did, to our surprise and delight. And where is that piece now? Or that piece now is, is uh, it's, it's a first, this piece was a first draft. And part of the thing about a first draft is you, you, all these things you've been thinking about, you set them down and you look at them and you say, well, that's not it. This has to happen. That has to happen. You can't get to that without the first mm -hmm. draft. So the first draft is done. There's talk of maybe a residency at uh, Jacob's Pillow in the spring. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's the theater thing. You need, you need a few hundred thousand dollars in a, a lot of other people to do it. We hope that's going to be forthcoming. Okay. My last question for you, Sean, is what's next? Where, where's Sean Kernan going next? Oh, so I've never known. <laughs> I've never known. Um, I've never known. But, but in a way, back to, back, to, back to the beginning when nobody expected anything of me. Uh, you can get caught up in your, in your life and career and say, well, what should Sean Kernan be doing next? But back in the beginning, I'd, I'd like to just kind of be, be empty and walk around and see what doors open and allow myself to do that and pull
pull apart that habit that says, well, I have, I have to do my list first, and then when time allows, I'll go work for myself. The work for yourself is really at the center of it. Work for yourself. That's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, I, if, uh, if you're familiar with the tarot, I'd almost say that you're, you're, you're playing the role of the fool card. You're not making a predisposition. <laughs> you're, you're, just, you're just wandering through. And, and did that work for you in the past? And it's, it's working for you in the future? It's always worked. It's the only thing that's worked. All my plans fall apart. <laughs> well, Sean, I want to thank you greatly for coming here today thank and you. speaking with us. That was, that was wonderful. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone again for the next installment of Real Exposures. Thank you very much.